February's Las Vegas Money Show Traders Expo, Ralph Acampora and Craig Johnson had a fireside chat to discuss which sectors appealed to them this year. People get very excited as the market's going up. We get very depressed as the market's going down. We measure all of that. So keep that in mind, please. It's very, very important. Fear and greed never changes. No, we're human beings, we're emotional. And especially when it comes to our money, we're very emotional. <laughs> Following their fireside chat, I sat down with Craig and Ralph to dive deeper into their 2024 market outlook. Gentlemen, how are you? Fine. Doing well. Thanks. Uh, great show. I've heard your, your class that you gave. People were giving rave reviews on everything you had there, found it very valuable. Why don't you, we start by, and whoever wants to take this is fine, start by talking about what you're seeing in the markets here from a technical standpoint, and we'll just let the conversation go. Well, we've had uh, quite a move in the previous few months, and, uh, and I call it the nosebleed territory. When you have, again, from a technical point of view, you have stocks that were literally on spikes. And I mean, that's not the worst thing in the world. Yep. I mean, at least suggests that there should be some pause or a pullback. And I think we started to see that a couple of days ago. Got it. Okay. How about you? Yeah, from my perspective, 2024 looks very different than what we saw in 2023. 2023, we thought it was going to be a, a hop, a drop, and a pop in the market. And we certainly got all that to play out, but just more compressed than what we thought it was going to be. And for 2024, it looks like to us to be an HLTR. Okay. Which is a high level trading range. Market rallied up 20 plus percent off of those October lows. And now at this point in time, we're going to likely repeat history to a degree and sort of consolidate this market ahead of the presidential election coming up in November timeframe. And we think it's probably a five to 10 percent sort of trading range uh, from now until the election. So wouldn't be surprised to see this market pull back 4,600 on the lower end, 5,000 on the upper end, end the year 50 50. Not that we're questioning it, but a year at objective of 50 50 on the SP 500. Okay. All right. And, you know, obviously the big round number of SP 5,000, people got very excited about it. Some of the other people I've spoken to have noted, well, you still have parts of the market, the Russell and so on, that haven't participated as much. What are your thoughts on that? On um, big round numbers, do they matter? And what do you, would you like to see in terms of participation? I, I'm a big uh, believer in bull markets live on the rotation under the surface. And we started to see that. And that was encouraging. And I, I agree with uh, what Prey just said, that uh, we're probably in the pullback phase here. And it'll be very interesting to see what the small and mid-cap stocks do on a pullback, because uh, I would think they would hold up fairly well. Yep. And uh, coming out of that correction, um, you'll, you'll see a market broaden out and uh, move higher towards the end of the year. Yep. Yeah, I think the round numbers are important, as Ralph mentioned in here. And 5,000 is certainly a very, very meaningful number. And we're just trying to break out to get above the highs we were in uh, 2001, uh, 22 period of time. And I think at this point in time, it's probably going to take a little bit more time to sort of digest the move we just did, get people a little bit more confident that the economy is not going into a recession and the technicals are sort of shaping up. In terms of large versus small, I think 2024 is going to be a year where the mag seven become the lag seven. Okay. OK, great companies, but probably are not going to be great stocks in the coming period of time. Take Apple as an example. Wonderful company, new Vision Pro headset. Ralph certainly likes the Vision Pro headset <laughs> for sure. And at this point in time, it's just going sideways. And you think about some of the rules that Ralph has talked about in our seminar, where we're talking about stock going sideways, the relative performance going lower. That's not going to be a stock that's going to get the attention of a lot of portfolio managers right now. So that's why I think these small mid cap stocks are going to play catch up and you're going to start to see that play out. And what it's going to take is the Fed to start cutting rates, which looks like could be happening in the May, June time frame. And when the Fed is cutting is usually when small mid cap stocks perform. They started underperforming when they started raising rates um, back in 2022. And at this point in time, I'm looking for small mid cap stocks to outperform. And by the way, since 1980, IWM has outperformed the S&P 500 consistently in presidential election years. I don't think this year is going to be any different. Yep, that's a good nugget there. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, the bears will say, OK, if we lose the MAG-7, we lose the market, whereas a more bullish interpretation is we might lose them or they'll go flat, but the rest of the market will catch up. It sounds like you're more in that, that second scenario camp, right? 
Yeah, I, I'm definitely in that ladder camp scenario. I still think there's a lot of good companies below the surface. If you look at Snowflake, it's already had a huge sell off. It's starting to make a big base, starting to improve. Um, you look at some of those non MAG7 companies in technology, they're doing well. But also think about this the composition of the Russell 2000, primarily financials, healthcare, and industrials. And industrials have been working, financials have been uh, not working. But if the Fed is going to start the cut, they should start to respond. Net interest margins improve and they start to do well as the yield curve starts to become normal, sloping once again. And then lastly, healthcare. It's been way out of favor for a long time. And I'm finally starting to see some of the long dated parts of healthcare like biotech starting to pick up and show better relative and absolute performance. So I think we're setting up for, again, at HLTR, where the small mid cap stocks play catch up in that environment and your mag seven lag. Ralph, from a sector standpoint, anything you want to add to that? I know when we spoke back in December, I think you mentioned financials tentatively looked like they were improving, and you even talked about some other sector airlines, if memory serves. I'm kind of curious as to what things you've seen sector-wise that, that look good to you here. Well, I agree with, with what uh, Craig was saying. Uh, it's the rotation that, that really is the underlying strength of the market. And uh, I'm not bearish on the the Magnificent Seven. I, I think... Their pullback is justified. I think it's it, it's more than uh, required because of the gains that they had. But uh, looking forward, uh, I think they'll participate, but uh, maybe not be the leaders that they were. So I, I think uh, this is the presidential election year. And uh, usually, uh, as Craig pointed out, we, we get that initial rally and then we get the pullback. And so far, it appears to be happening that way. But towards the end of the year, as we go into election time, the market starts to pick up again. Okay. So I'm in that camp. Okay. Thoughts on other parts of the market out there? I mean, anything you want to add on maybe interest rates or, or you know, people are talking about Bitcoin, whatever we can we sure. can or we don't need to. But I'm also curious about precious metals, things that are uh, other asset classes. Yeah. I mean, for me, just touching on sectors a little bit, too. So with our work, we're recommending services companies, which are really not on a lot of people's radar. But if you look at companies like Accenture, they're making a big base on the charts on a weekly basis, starting to show improvement. We still like tech. This doesn't have to be the mag seven. And we think financials are really setting up to do well uh, throughout 2024 as the breadth of this market broadens out and it starts to uh, show an improvement. But right now, more time. In terms of other parts of the market, I think one of the topics that people do not talk enough about are 10 year bond yields. OK, we've had a secular, as Ralph would call it, secular long term trend change, a 40 year trend change in 10 year bond yields playing out. Everybody needs to realize that these secular changes, they don't reverse in a New York minute. OK, they take years to play out. And if you go back and you study the 1980 period of time. And Ralph can probably relive this for us like it was yesterday. And that's that's great. I, I can't. I wasn't around in the market at that point in time. But it, you go back and you study this. There were huge trading opportunities and there were huge time frame for this to play out. It literally took about five to seven years to truly say you've had a reversal, a retest, and then a continuation of the new trend play out. As Ralph talks about higher highs and higher lows, that took years to play out. It's going to take years again. And what we need to do, as all investors need to do, is think about 10-year bond yields in one-year time increments and sort of lay that out for people to understand how they should set up their portfolios in this changing interest rate environment and recognize longer term there has been this secular change. But don't go to the binary outcome of, oh, rates are just higher, everything is bad, because that's not going to be the case. Got it. Too bad we don't have a, a long-term chart of interest rates, but it's a 30, 40 year cycle up, started in the 40s and weaked in the in the early 80s. And then you had that 30, almost 40, 25, 30 year down. And we're at the lower end of that. You know, I, I I tell all my young friends, I said, go out and buy a house. <laughs> Interest rate mortgages were down 2 3%. I said, because when I bought an apartment in New York City in 1994, I paid 12%. Yeah. So uh, I'm not saying you can see those rates, those mortgages uh, anytime soon, but the cycle is back up. And, and to quote Craig, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. This is a bump in the grind. And, and I, 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 I agree the rates will come back down, but... Uh, 
that cycle is changing for sure. And, then, the, oh, and Mike, and I would just add in terms of crypto, with some of the uh, ETFs being approved now and, and, and recognized by the SEC and stuff, I, I think crypto is getting a little bit more life bre uh, breathe into it at this point in time. And I think that's going to be constructive. Um, I keep watching BlackRock, I keep watching uh, Fidelity, and I keep watching Coinbase. Those are the three things that I keep watching to say, is this industry becoming more legitimate? And it seems to me that all those seem to tell me that it is becoming more legitimate. So it doesn't have to be all just Bitcoin. It could be other things out there that can perform well. But if we're looking for that next big winner in the market, I'm keeping my eye on Coinbase. Right, because it is going to become the most popular way for retail investors to participate if they want to get directly into the coins. But if they want to just play it and have a better tax advantage way of doing it, they're going to go out and buy either the ARK, G, uh, ARK B fund or they're going to go buy some of the Fidelity ETF funds out there. Because, again, you can have short term or long term gains there. But if you're playing it just the coins itself through Coinbase, it's all short term capital gains. So there's a tax advantage to play the ETFs. All right. And the time we have left, uh, let's shift a little bit to tactics. I mean, you had a, a long class that, again, people were very happy with. Do you mind sharing a nugget or two of the, the types of indicators that you think are the most valuable in this market or in your work you pay the most attention to that maybe we can help share? Well, well I start off by saying keep it simple. And I'm a big fan of watching price. Uh, you don't own the R, uh, RSI or the MACD indicator, although they're very helpful. But, and I insisted that the, the attendees uh, watch my slides and I was going through the process of identifying trends and identifying when those trends change. And then Craig followed up with the indicators. So it was a nice overlap. Excellent, excellent. What were some of the things that, that again, you paid particular attention to in this market? Well, a lot of things from the class itself. There was a lot of interest. People were very focused in on understanding the basics, and there was definitely some uh, interest to kind of go beyond. Like, how do we trade some of these indicators? How do we trade RSI? How do we trade MACD? Um, but I think the key question that people still want to understand, and I think we kind of worked on this question a little bit, is you don't have to use the same indicator for every single thing you're doing. There isn't a silver bullet to trading and thinking about trend, direction, combining it together with some of these indicators to improve your probabilities of being right. Ralph did a terrific job in framing up the, the direction, the trend, and putting those pieces together. And now you can just overlay some of those momentum indicators to help you understand the strength of the moves in the market at this point in time. But it was a great class, a lot of questions. And I, I think people learned a lot. I think they were really happy with it. Good. Well, Ralph, Craig, I really do appreciate you taking the time here to chat, uh, share some of your knowledge and wisdom and now look on this market. So again, great time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Take care. Okay. And thank you for watching. We'll be publishing more interviews and bonus episodes recorded at the Las Vegas Money Show Traders Expo. So make sure you subscribe to our channel or follow the Money Masters podcast wherever you get your podcasts.